Jenkins, I have no more food for you. You had two French fries. You, you should have followed that other guy. <laughs> Dog. He took the food. Yeah, he took the food. Get out. All right. Oh, yep, he listened and he left. I, I did not mean to refer to him as that other guy, except that we that's how we think no, it's the other guy, yeah. Us, is like the lady and that guy. Uh-huh. Now, we, uh, we refer to all of our dogs as idiots. <laughs> Mike's our every, when our niece came home, she's like, "Secure the idiots and uh, get them ready." We could say crazies. It's not that far off. <sighs> Ours are they're foolish. They're just they're yeah. foolish. Is that too loud? Hear that? So, and Nicole and Ashley, are you familiar with the uh, when we get to fifteen minutes on a topic? Roger will play that music he's been playing just now. Oh, he'll play us out. Move, yeah, to move on. To move on to greener pastures. Sounds good. Ray the dog is a fly hunter lately. We've been getting flies, house flies, and uh, she can catch them. She catches them. Wow. Yeah. Not only that, but then she kind of toys with them, and I have to go take them wow. away because I'm like, <laughs> like, she just like just. I don't know if she just runs them or if they're dead. But then she just le- they're on the floor in front of her, and then she'll like, bud like knock them around Mess with, with them. her paw and like, <laughs> playing with them. I mean, even my cats, I don't think, catch flies. They try. No, I know. None of my other dogs have ever done that. You should try to figure out how to make money from this. <laughs> I should. I start you know? <laughs> Call Ray, your, yeah. f- your fly tech. An fly exterminator. <laughs> Ray the fly girl. Ooh, that's a good one. And it could be like, you know, she could kind of be wearing like a cool bandana, yeah, you guess. know, on the billboard. The yeah. right. billboard. Some cool joggers. Right, right, right. She'll dance your bugs away. Oh, my office is looks like a tornado hit it. I feel bad. No, you're fine. I have so many suitcases. I have like suitcases. We got home two days ago, so it's you like just audio still. People. It's fine. Is that does my audio sound okay? That's yeah, yeah. Right? yes, sounds great. Okay, good. I have a I got a new mic set up and I'm excited about it. Oh, yeah. It's a. I bought a Chaotica eyeball, mm-hmm. Ooh. and um, and then I have a uh, a really nice Audio Technica mic in there now. Um, I think I had that in D and D once. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's like uh, it's like I wish my I could... wizard. My wizard was able to cast a Chaotica eyeball. No, it's exactly. It's, here's, here it is. Look at how big this thing is. Oh wow! Wow! Yes. But it's like it's supposed to make it its own little, you know, sound studio. Nice. It sounds good. Yeah, I like it. Well, if everybody's ready, we can go ahead and get rolling. Roll. Do it. How do we feel? We feel we feel ready. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. All right. All right. 15 seconds. Here we go. And uh, am I ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. I'll uh, count us in. Five, four, three, two, one. Thanks to everyone who supports Daily Tech News Show directly. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Friday, October 26, 2018 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm from the fringes of the L.A. County Empire. I'm Roger Che, the producer. Welcome, everyone, to our roundtable episode, where we expand our show into a full-fledged one-hour roundtable discussion with Sarah and myself and our guests. Joining us today, Nicole Lee from Engadget.com. Welcome, Nicole. Hello. Glad to be here. Thank you for joining us. Also, Ashley Esqueda, host of CNET's Stream Economy, is with us. Ashley, welcome back. Oh, it's terrible to be here. No, it's great. I'm excited. <laughs> We know you mean that in the best way. Possibly. I do. I love you guys so much. Uh, we've missed you both. It's good to have you both back. And while all of our topics cover news of the day today, we're going to start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft has completed its acquisition of GitHub. GitHub, of course, is a large code repository, popular resource for developers and companies for hosting projects, documentation, and of course, code. Apple and Amazon and Google and a lot of other big tech companies use GitHub, but Microsoft says it will continue to operate GitHub independently as a business. Bloomberg sources say Samsung's foldable phone is codename winner. It would not have a fingerprint sensor due to technical difficulties unique to its flexible screen, but it would 
have an extra four inch screen on the outside, letting you enjoy some basic features without having to unfold it. A source also says Samsung and Google have been working together on developing a special version of Android for a foldable phone. Amazon's reported Q3 revenue increased 29% over last year. North American sales were up 35%, although international sales grew just 13%. Amazon Web Services sales rose 46%, narrowly missing expectations. And Amazon's other category, which includes its advertising business, rose 123%. Nice work. Amazon also projected holiday quarter revenue between $66.5 and $72.5 billion, and that's below the expected $73.79 billion from analysts. Amazon continuing to become more of an ad company. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, ad company Alphabet beat earnings and revenue expectations in Q3. Overall revenues were up 21% year over year. The advertising business as part of Alphabet's Google division accounts for 85.8% of Alphabet's revenue. And that revenue is up 20% year over year. Alphabet's other revenue category, which is pretty much everything that isn't Google, uh, hardware sales, cloud business, et cetera, uh, rose 29% year over year, slower than last year, last quarter's 37% rise. At TwitchCon today, Snap announced Snap Camera for Mac and Windows, which will integrate with apps like Twitch and YouTube and Skype and Zoom and others. So you can use one of thousands, the Snapchat says there are thousands of its lenses, which are basically the same thing as filters, during important <laughs> remote work meetings or while gaming or while you are streaming for some other reason. Snap Camera works as a camera output on a third-party desktop app. Now, a Snapchat account isn't required to use the app, and in fact, Snap Camera can't access Snapchat accounts at all. It's a whole different thing. Snap says they're a camera company, so this is the first time they've actually proven that, like, hey, we're going to have other products to, besides. We'll all use the Snap Camera on a future episode of the show. Yeah, maybe. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Let's get into the roundtable, Sarah. Let's do it. Ashley, this is your discussion topic. I know you just got back from Europe, but we're going to hold your feet to the fire. No, I'm just kidding. Please. Let's talk about the idea of VOD services and how successful they are because AT&T, which owns Warner Media and Turner and Warner Brothers Digital Networks, did announce today, Friday, that its Filmstruck streaming service, which I had not heard of, to be quite honest, but a lot of people have, indie, art house, classic films, is going to shut down on November 29th. The service stopped allowing signups today, October 26th. And the move comes after Warner Brothers Digital Networks already shut down Drama Fever. That was a VOD subscription service specialized in Korean dramas. That shut down on October 16th quite abruptly. And then a week ago, Turner announced it was shuttering the digital content and TV studio Super Deluxe. So what is the future of these services that uh, so many companies had spun out as a la carte services? There are too many of them and how niche can they be and still be successful? Yeah, I think this is sort of, uh, we're kind of reaching this apex where we're gonna start seeing these, like you said, really small niche services get canceled because there just aren't enough, they're not revenue drivers. And so especially Filmstruck, as soon as the Time Warner deal went through, they were just like, well, we're gonna start cutting back on all of this, uh, all of these things that are not really revenue drivers. And obviously, this is an extremely niche service and it's popular enough. Like I know a lot of people who subscribe to Filmstruck and they love the Criterion collection there, uh, having access to all of those classic films. Like I think it's an important service to offer, but I also don't know that it can stand on its own. Right. So um, I think now that we're seeing uh, the Netflix model, uh, everybody's kind of finally gotten wise to the game, right? So it's like, it's taken a few years, but we're now going to see Apple launch a streaming service. We're going to see Disney launch a streaming service and take all their toys from Netflix and take them away and be like, no, I can't have those anymore. Um, and we're going to see more and more of that. So um, I saw an article a few days ago, uh, or I guess now it was a couple of weeks ago because I was on vacation, but um, somebody was complaining that there are too many streaming services. They're like, okay, now I have to, you know, we've all been there. So it's like, you've got your cord cutting service, then you have, you know, maybe an HBO or a Showtime or both. And then you have Hulu and Netflix and then, okay, well now I want these niche services like Crunchyroll or I want, you know, a uh, film struck or, 
uh, anything else that's really small. And somebody was saying, well, now we're getting back into cable packages. And I think that's true, but this is what we asked for, right? Like for the longest time, everybody's like, why can't I just subscribe to this one channel? Or like, why can't I just subscribe to this one show or, you know, whatever that is. And it feels like we're getting to that point and people are realizing what that actually means, which is one, this is exhausting. And two, um, it's, it is not sustainable. Like this is not a sustainable business model for so many services. You know, you have to have the backing of a major corporation now, a media corporation. And now there are only six in the US. There's, you know, like out of the six, actually now it'll be five, right? With the Disney Fox merger. Well, so, and it also starts adding up cost-wise too, you know, sort of yeah. like that bookstore that has a certain kind of feel. Well, that might be a lovely bookstore, but then if Amazon has all those same books plus all the other books and they can either undercut or, 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 or yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or, or maintain, you know, a similar price, it becomes harder and harder for something like a film strip, which as you said, a lot of people really enjoyed um, to be, one of many a la carte services that people would want. Right, right, exactly. And Nicole, like, I don't know how much you do cord cutting and stuff, but like, I know for me, it's, it's got, it has gotten worse in the, the point where like, I subscribe to a bunch of stuff. And then over time now, it, like coming towards the end of the year, I'm starting to realize like, okay, I don't need this service. Like, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm gonna, and I think most people are doing that now. Like they're saying, okay, I'm being a little more discerning about what I actually wanna watch. And we all know that we talk about peak TV all the time on Stream Economy because it's a show about geek pop culture and entertainment. And you're even seeing companies like Netflix realize that they can't make all the shows they make because there just isn't enough eyeballs, right? Like to watch everything that they're putting out it just doesn't exist. And so it's like they're canceling shows. They canceled American Vandal today. They canceled two out of the four Marvel shows, which is a huge deal. I mean, nobody ever thought those shows would be canceled. Well, isn't part of the cancellation because Disney wants to own everything Marvel now? I think that was the part of the problem that you mentioned earlier, how it's kind of consolidating forces. A lot of these companies are, are joining forces into uh, a single company. And I think that's that's yeah. what you get, you know, people will take Marvel away from Netflix so that they can show it on their own right. entity. And, uh, and I think there is an issue of, uh, you know, is it the same as cable? I mean, yes, if you let it be. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that the, 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 the thing that doesn't make it cable is that you still have some control over what you, what you subscribe, what you not don't subscribe. I mean, I do agree that you don't get the same level of, it's the same number of channels, for example, sure. like, but you know, I subscribe, you watch? right. So, all watch? right. So like I subscribe to YouTube TV, but that doesn't have, you know, the cooking channel, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a bummer, but I'm not going to change my, my whole life just so I can watch the cooking. You know what I mean? Like, right. so that yeah. all those compromises you make anyway. Um, so, I don't know. But, it, but the, for me, I think, I think it's the point, fine. Though, I think it's, it's as the more of these services that we're seeing and the more options we have within those services of what to watch, it makes it harder and harder for these more um, inexpensive boutique sort of shows to make it, right? So, I, I think we're going to get to a point where um, I know with the Marvel stuff, I have a feeling licensing is a big one. I know Netflix obviously probably pays Disney an obscene amount of money to license four different Defender shows. And if they're not seeing the numbers that they want with a show like Luke Cage, which was not very critically uh, well received, it wasn't very good. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, Iron Fist, which was very poorly received. And then Luke Cage, which was well received, but maybe not as um, not as much viewed as a Daredevil, which I don't think... Netflix will let Disney wrestle away from them um, until, you know, they're basically forced to. But like, I'm still worried about Jessica Jones. I think Daredevil's fine. I think that'll probably come back for a fourth season, maybe a fifth, and then they'll they'll wrap it up. That'll be it. And then Disney will say, okay, now that's ours again. And like, that's fine. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And um, but I, I do think that like, we're hitting a point where, like you said, with the cooking channel, we're able to be a little bit better about saying like, okay, kill your darlings. Like I can't watch all of this. So what's the most important to me, right? So 
I have Philo as our uh, TV streaming provider and it's like 16 bucks a month, which is really cheap. And it comes with, because it's owned by all of the companies that own like, you know, Viacom. And so it's got Comedy Central and, you know, all the shows that are harder to find on some of the regular like streaming cord cutting services or all the channels. Um, but I don't have local video and I, I don't have local TV and I don't have uh, live news and I don't have sports. And like, for some people that's a deal, total deal breaker. But for me, it's like, that's exactly what I don't watch. So it's like, I get all my news from online and I don't, you know, my local news, I can watch, you know, any, if there's something breaking, I can watch it online again. And also with sports, like I don't really watch sports. And if I do, I'm either out with friends, like watching it at a bar or something, or I'm just not watching it at home. So Sorry, my dogs are going berserk. They're great. They hate it. streaming services, you guys. <laughs> uh, a couple of things to keep in mind here. I, it, it wasn't Disney, by all accounts, wanted to continue Iron Fist and and uh, Luke Cage on Netflix. It was Netflix that decided not to. Oh. Certainly, the fact that Disney is con- beginning a competing service uh, complicates that relationship and and most definitely had some effect no matter what yeah. time. And and like you said, Ashley, I'm sure Netflix is going to keep going with Daredevil. Netflix still has the license to use those other characters. They just didn't want to spend money on those shows. They'll be spending those plenty of money on other shows, uh, yeah. borrowing another $2 billion. The other thing is I think Filmstruck, Drama Fever, et cetera, are a victim of Warner Media changing strategy now that AT&T owns them mm-hmm. to say, let's have a package. They've talked about yeah. creating a package with the Turner Networks and HBO as sort of the so new together streaming service. And so yeah. I think all of this stuff that's in Drama Fever and in uh, the Criterion Collection, all that is going to go into that service and they're going to try to make it an easier choice, kind of like a Philo competitor. It won't have everything, but it'll have that stuff. And it'll be like, oh, okay, well, here's the core package, which is your AT&T Time Warner channels that we own. And then it will be add $5 a month to add the, the, the film struck package, which will have, you know, the, all of this stuff or, you know, $7 a month to add it with the criterion collection or whatever. So they'll, it'll probably end up where, however it ends up being relaunched will actually probably end up being cheaper um for consumers because i think film struck with criterion was 10 or 11 dollars a month which is like a 4k subscription to netflix so um so i think it'll be better for consumers in the long run as long as those movies are all still offered and there is something that you know they're able to to get for that you know to they're able to access those things i think that's the thing i'm most scared about is like when we when we can't access stuff and we saw like wasn't there an article a few days ago about how piracy is actually on the rise now because of all these streaming services that are like making it more and more difficult to to get stuff we actually talked about that here and on cord killers both i'm a little skeptical that the conclusion is piracy is on the rise because of the number of streaming services because the the slight decline in the decline mm-hmm. i'm not even sure you can call it a rise is in regions that don't have as many streaming services. They just don't have the not, options. Not in the places yeah. that have lots of streaming services. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I've i been thinking about this all day. I actually tweeted this earlier. We have, on the one hand, everyone's saying there's too many TV shows. I can't keep up. And on the other hand, saying there's too many streaming services. I can't keep up. I think one is the answer to the other, which is we just have to get over the idea that we could watch all the TV shows yeah. we wanted to. Like you got to get over the FOMO. The there's, FOMO is just, yeah. you got to just deal with it. Yeah, there's going to be more good shows than you can watch, just like there are more good books than you can read and more good music than you could listen to and discover. Uh, and and that's overall a, a good thing. We just, we just used to there not being that much good television and being able to pay one company so that we can complain that they're not delivering the TV because the cable went out. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and we're all millennials, right? So it's like, we're all used well. to, I would say like, okay, so we're all used to yes. accessing everything and being able to see everything. And we're reaching a point now where we can't, and that's very frustrating. So I like one, like you just have more responsibilities as you go on in life, like whatever they may be. And two, like you just can't, there is so much more now. And so even in the last five years, there's so much more now. And so to think that you can, you know, we're so used to being able to see it all and now we can't. And that becomes really frustrating. And I think we'll get over the resistance to buying 
television shows digitally. A lot of people mm -hmm. basically discount that idea. Like, well, if I can't get it through a streaming service that I pay for, for a cheap amount of money, forget it. And yeah. it's like, well, if, if Philo only has one show you like, and it's not worth paying the $16 to be able to watch just it immediately it. when it comes out, then just buy it. That's what we do with, that's what we did with Star Wars Rebels. Like we didn't have XD, we wanted to watch Rebels. And I was like, well, I would have to subscribe to like Sling TV and add a $5 Disney package. Like, I don't want to do any of that. So we ended up just adding it. We ended up just buying the season. And like Drag Race was the same until it moved to VH1. I was like, well, I don't watch Logo for any other show. And I don't want to add it on as an extra package because because I don't watch it, like except for that one show. And so over the course of a year, I know I get at least one season of RuPaul's Drag Race. So if I'm paying an extra five dollars <laughs> a month, five times 12 is 60. So it's a lot cheaper to just buy the season like that's fine. You know, it's, it's funny. I recently had a conversation with my mom because I love Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. And she was like, oh, yeah, I've heard of that show. What what channel? I said HBO. And she goes, well, but. I canceled HBO because Game of Thrones is isn't on and like she kind of like goes back and forth, right? She'll like sign up and then she doesn't want it anymore because she doesn't want to pay for the non Game of Thrones time of year. And that's a lot it, of people. And, uh, right, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it, I was like, you know, they might put their episodes on YouTube, maybe not all of them. And then it's sort of like sometimes it's snippets. It right. does get complicated when somebody wants to watch a particular show. Mm -hmm. And of course, yes, HBO has has its VOD offerings as well. Um, and, you know, so, some options there. But it's a conversation I have with people more and more. Uh, Bodyguard, which is a, a BBC show, which has recently come to Netflix. I was talking about it uh, with a friend. And I was like, it's so good. And he was like, but how do you, hmm. And I'm like, well, don't you worry about it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, it, again, it's like, ah, I want to watch this stuff. I want to be part of the conversation. Yes. But there are limitations. Even if you want to pay, there are limitations at yeah. times. Yeah. It's, it's, there are limitations of a lot of different things. It's your time, your money, access. Like, it's just, and it, and I think the most important thing is exactly what you just said, which is we all want to be part of the conversation, right? So you come into work or you talk to your friends, you hang out with your pals and or your family, and everybody want, is talking about Haunting on Hill House, right? And so everybody's like, oh, you gotta watch Haunting on Hill House, it's so amazing. And, and then the one person's like, oh, I, I, I don't have time, I missed it. And then you feel left out, you know? You feel left out of that conversation. And everybody in this day and age, in, two, in the year of our Lord 2018, <laughs> everybody needs to be part of the conversation. I, I remember, uh being in the office at tech TV, everybody talking about Sopranos. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't even have cable. I don't, not only do I not have HBO, I don't, <laughs> I don't have cable. And they're like, well, well, what, what do you watch? I'm like, mm, watch over over the air broadcasts or, or things yeah. on, on VCR. Cause that's how long ago it was. Um, but that existed before it was just that, you know, at a certain point you got, uh, you got a stable enough job <laughs> that you paid for cable. And then then maybe you could <laughs> afford HBO. HBO was always the one thing that maybe not everybody had, but sure. everybody had everything else. So it's just a different situation now. And yeah. even things like The Bodyguard or just Bodyguard, uh, I watched it last night on Netflix. It finally did come. So again, if, if you don't need to watch it right away, mm -hmm. you probably will be able to get it in an affordable fashion. Yeah. And if, if you, you do need to watch it right away, there's probably a limited number of those shows and you can afford to subscribe to just the services that bring you those shows. Which also right. has made spoiler alerts so much more annoying, right? Mm. Because we're all watching things at different times. So yep. if I see Bodyguard and Tom just started Bodyguard and Ashley is just going to get to it eventually. You know, it's like we, this is, you know, our appointment yeah. viewing has taken on an entire new meaning. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's like books, right? That too. I mean, yeah. <laughs> although, although when's the last time you're like, let me tell you about this book. And I'm like, spoiler. No, it's, <laughs> that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we're just used to it because it isn't the same problem. All right, let's uh, move on to Nicole Lee. Your discussion topic today is about smart displays. Uh, I, I imagine you've been uh, looking over all these new smart displays as Facebook gets into the game. Google, of course, refreshing theirs. Amazon updating theirs as well. Uh, let's talk about smart displays. Are they the new, which which device category are they the new one? Are they the new smartphone, the new laptop, the new tablet? What do you think? <laughs> 
So they are such an unusual thing. Uh, you know, Amazon's Echo Show was the first to come up with it. And it, what is what the whole idea of it to, to begin with was that they added a screen to a smart speaker, like an Alexa or whatever it was. And then and then Google came up with their own versions of it, the Google Assistant into like the Lenovo Smart Display and the JBL LinkView and the most recently the, the Google Home Hub. And uh, it's the, the Home Hub was the one that really made me think this is such a weird thing because the home hub is basically like if you if you take a, take a look at it, it's basically like a phablet on a stand. Mm -hmm. So it, like it really it really looks like somebody stuck a Galaxy Note onto like a stand, and that's what it looks like. And I w at first I was like, this is such a weird thing, but because but at the same time though, it doesn't do the same things that the tablet does. It's kind of a new category, if you will, and. Anytime there's a there's a new category, anytime there's a, there's a new there's a new thing of something, you have to ask like, what problem does it solve? Like where does it go? Um, I think a lot of times people are thinking of this in terms of like the Amazon Echo, for example, when that first came out, people were like, oh, who needs a smart speaker or a, a, an Alexa in their home? And it became really like incredibly popular. So. And in comparison to that, I think this is definitely better. Like in my opinion, adding a screen or a display to an Echo or to a Google Home device makes it so much more useful because I can actually see the results. And there's something about visual, something so satisfying about a visual response that I think cannot be beat by hearing the answer from a speaker. Mm -hmm. um, but so, it's it's a weird thing. I think that the 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 two the two devices that I think make the case for it is um, the Echo Spot, which is the little round alarm clock thing, mm -hmm. and the Home Hub, which is the little which is again the Google Home Hub. And the reason why I think those two stand out for me, even though I do like the Echo Show and I do like the the bigger smart display as well, but the reason why I think those two resonate with me is because I think those are the two more mainstream products because who doesn't want a cute alarm clock? Uh, you know, and who doesn't want like a cool little smart photo frame or digital photo frame? So those two things I think that people will understand. Oh, it's just it's just a photo frame with, with Google in it. Okay, I understand that, right? Or if it's uh, an alarm oh, it's an alarm clock with Alexa in it. Okay, I understand that. Versus like the other products that are like just <laughs> basically weird second TVs that you put in your kitchen or something. Um, so <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the other thing is that they always push, they always push the cooking feature in all of these products. Mm -hmm. You can say, hey, hey, you know, Alexa, show me recipe for, I don't know, chicken soup or whatever. And it will show you like a list of recipes. You can say, oh, step by step. And that sounds cool. And I've done it before. And that's really neat. But I don't think that way, I guess. Like I'm the kind of person who like skips ahead and, mm -hmm. and sees what, what, what the end result is and then I'll, and I'll, I'll skip it and, and I'll go back. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think linearly when it comes to recipes, I sort of like, oh, that's cool that the step one is to fill the pot of water, but I wanna see what step five is so that I can get ready for it, right? So mm -hmm. I don't really think that way in terms of recipe. Maybe I'm that's weird, like I don't know. That's like normal chef stuff. They are supposed to read the whole <laughs> recipe before you start. That's exactly. <laughs> like I read, I read the whole thing the and whole then thing. No, that's, I, what, that's what I do. If I have a recipe that I've made multiple times, but I don't quite have it memorized, I I love the idea of my Echo Show being able to display the steps for me so I can just look like, oh, I need, because I actually take my recipes and modify and put them in simple note in like step order so that it's like, oh, saute the mushrooms while that's boiling kind of stuff. That's all customized to me. I totally want that on the show, but that's not what you can get there. You can't no. just put your simple note up there. No. You get some custom recipe thing that may not have the recipe you're looking for. And like you say, generally it's recipes you haven't tried before, which is well, you probably want to review them at least first before yeah. you start them. So I end up never using it. You need to have like um, like a car play, but like for your kitchen, they were like, hey, I'm cooking like right now. So could you just simplify this down for me? Because that would be great. I'm well, I mean, I'm actually in the market for a new microwave. And so I was I was revisiting Amazon's smart microwave, which is, you know, you can pre-order to be delivered sometime in November. So right around the corner now. And it's like, 
Okay, well, it hooks into Alexa, so I can hands-free the microwave things. That's pretty cool. But I still have to use my hands to put things in the microwave. So it's yeah. like kind of cool, but I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense. It also only comes in black, and I'm not sure why that is. Because <laughs> black goes with everything. But that, but that's another thing, too. It's like this is, yeah, this is something that, like you said, Nicole, who doesn't want a cute alarm clock? Well, I mean, my alarm clock is my cell phone because it's just right. on my nightstand. And then yeah. when I leave, right. then the, you know, the, the alarm clock comes with me. Right. I guess I'd like something cute that sits there. But then that takes away from my nightstand real estate because it's not a very big one. <laughs> So it's, yeah, it kind of turns into like, is this fashion? Are my smart speakers a fashion item? I mean, I think they all look relatively nice, but it is a certain style that sh will and probably should be integrated into the things that we already have hanging around the house, like a television or, you know, something in the kitchen. Yeah. I like the Echo Dot in places like the bathroom where it can just be out of the way. Yeah. And I can say, hey, uh, add toilet paper to my shopping list, you know, without having to remember when <laughs> I go in, 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 in the other room or whatever. That's so <laughs> smart. Yeah. How can I incorporate this in my home? <laughs> It's kind. Of, it, it kind of depends on the function of it, right? I I yeah. want the Echo Show in the kitchen because that's when I'm going to have it play videos while I'm cooking or so yeah, or yeah. something like that. I'm sure. never going to use the recipes, like I said. But so it it really depends on where where you're using it, whether mm -hmm. you need that screen or not. And and I I think Nicole's absolutely right. The I want a little picture frame thing is is still something people love to do. And, yeah. and the alarm clock. Maybe you don't want an alarm clock, but if you do, that's kind of a nice uh, application of it as well. I have that little, my alarm clock. I have been trying to get away from using my phone as an alarm clock um, because I like, it's the, I, I'm trying to get off of this. Like it's the first thing I reach for in the morning. Like I don't, cause then it's like, I get stuck in the, in the trap, the right. social media trap. <laughs> but I like, I got a little, um, it's called the Devoom TV. It's a TV. little retro, uh, it's a little retro <laughs> looking television and you can set, it's got LED, like animated LEDs in it and stuff. You can program it. And it's so freaking cute. <laughs> D-I-V-O-O-M. I, I got to see this thing. It's really cute. Um, it's two O's. And it's uh, called the TV. It's, a, it's that second link down. It's that little TV right there. That's it. <laughs> How cute that oh, is. Wow. TV. Oh, like TV, but with an and extra it, O. Yeah, and it has a little app. And they have a time box, too. But, like, the TV is the one that looks like a little retro TV. I'm like, it's an alarm <laughs> clock. And it's, like, all this it connects to your connects to your phone you can like you can design your own little leds and they're animated and stuff it's great it's like the chumby except it's truly really pleasant it's a chumby i mean it's, it's just really pleasant you know like it's just something i'm like oh that's so cute every morning i'm like oh it's so cute like i don't feel like garbage because i picked up my phone and opened twitter so it's like it's a good way to start the day I will say that you know the, the 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 you saying that makes me realize uh because I've been putting the Google Home Hub as my quote unquote alarm clock on the side of my bed. And I used to use, like everybody, I guess, used to use my phone to sort of flip through things as I go to bed or wake up or whatever. Yeah. And now I feel like I have this. I don't really need my phone next to me. Yeah. And I've sort of been trying to just not bring it into bed every yeah. night. Same. I've been leaving it at the door. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. But now that I have this, I'm like, oh, it's kind of internet. You can have video and stuff. and it's sort of there. And so that really helps me to not have my phone next to me, but that's a really good. Oh, so it does. Uh, it's like, yeah, option. I was like, okay, I'm going to get this cute little thing and try it as an alarm. So I'm not immediately <laughs> opening Twitter and feeling existential dread. Like I just like, I have to get away from that. So I got away from that with this little thing. I got one in white. It's so cute. But like I said, it's like, you can set it to, uh, they even have I think I haven't tried it yet, but I think they even have like the the LED that like goes with sunrise sunset. Like you can have it like light up slowly oh, over yeah, time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of slowly light in the morning. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Yeah, so I, I thought those were cute. An old fashioned LED alarm clock, and I still use my phone as my alarm clock. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Well, it, and it also, at least for me, it's a. I just moved apartments, and so it's like. And my apartment is smaller. I have less room. I want fewer things. Mm. So yes, yeah. I agree with you that we shouldn't be, you know, laying in bed with existential dread, reading Twitter all day and night. Um, and I try not to do that as well. 
but I also don't want an extra thing that I have to buy for fifty dollars if I, I can help really it. Really, one thing like it's only for one thing. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I will say that um, you know, talking about about smart displays and the the Google Home Hub and the uh, the Echo Show and all that. There are going to be new devices, I think, next year where I think Lenovo's making one where it's basically a tablet that if you dock it into a, a, a speaker dock, it turns into a smart display. And I think mm. that's really compelling because you can, when you undock it, it becomes like a regular Android tablet. Yeah. But, when, but when, you, when you dock it into the, the whatever speaker dock or whatever, it, it sort of becomes and transforms into this, this smart display. And I think that's kind of an interesting use case where it can be both. Yeah. Best of both worlds, I guess. Amazon will do that. I mean, if they they are, do they have something similar? Or they did. Uh, yeah. Where it, I like, and I think we'll just see more and more and more of that. Yeah. I'm curious. How many of you have Twitter notifications on on your phone? Nope. I have DM notifications on. Mm. Yeah, I have. But that. but that's it. And you still get sucked in to the existential dread. That's just. Well, but that existential dread is not unique to Twitter. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm addicted to Twitter. And so I'm actually like iOS 12 is really helpful for me. I've been trying to like really take a step back and like mm -hmm. say, I don't. And I've been doing this with the news as well, where I'm like, I don't need to know every single thing that happens every oh. second of the day. Yes. And so I've been trying really hard, like with a lot of my digital life to sort of like find a window and like say, okay, like now is the time I'm going to check Twitter. Now is the time I'm going to mm -hmm, check the news. Mm -hmm. Like, and I just like, I've the, the news, like just national news, I, I felt much less stressed out about because it's like, you're just constantly bombarded with everybody telling you why this is a tragedy or a disaster or terrible or whatever. And so it's just like, I hate, first of all, the, the news itself can be really stressful. But then on top of that, when you see how distressed your friends are from the news, right. it's like, it and then you see right. one after the other, after the other, after the other, it just becomes this like, this really horrible place to be in where you're just like, I can't even help you now because now I feel paralyzed by it. And so, you know, everybody's drowning and nobody can, you know, get out of the water. And so I, I'm trying to be at the end of the water with a stick helping people get out. But I can't yeah. do that by being in the water all the time. I, I ask about that because I don't really want to display by my bedside because I feel like even even if it's dark with just white letters, that it's probably too bright. It's way too bright. Mm -hmm. And so no, I, I use my phone to read before I go to bed and, and I, I have notifications off for most things anyway, and then I have them stop at 10 p.m. So when I'm reading, I'm not just sure. at night anyway, I'm not I'm not interrupted. Um, and so I, I, I prefer that. But I don't know. Uh, I, was, I was curious if it was just that. But I, I think it's 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 just once you pick up that phone, you can go anywhere with it, which is a blessing and a curse. Right. Nicole, I think you're onto something with the tablet slash smart display thing. I mean, I have a tablet that I use for when I am interacting with it. But mm -hmm. then the cover gets closed and it gets put on a table or in my backpack or whatever, because I'm like, well, I don't need it unless I'm using yeah. it. Yeah. But if the, if it had a different function and could go somewhere, it kind of looked nice and was out of the way, and yeah. and there was there was there was functionality as a smart display. That would be I would make it you know, it would be twice as nice. That would and and it would be cost the same as a regular tablet. So, right, uh, exactly. Yeah. Just just a little more for the dock, right? But hopefully that. <laughs> yeah, the dock would cost more. That's true. Oh, just buy <laughs> but, an uh, easel. <laughs> Well, it's like buying a keyboard for a Surface tablet, right? It's an annoying cost, but yeah. There but you go. kind of mandatory if you want to really enjoy it to its fullest. Yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, let's get into our next topic, which is not the advisor voted topic, but it is one that several of our patrons who are at the advisor level nominated. It didn't win the vote, but we thought it was interesting. So we kind of combined a few of them, Sarah. Yeah, we did. So this is... The concept, speaking of existential dread, uh, yeah. the concept of the future of the human workforce and how people might need to or want to or at least be able to switch careers as their jobs are automated or changed. Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit on DTNS. Um, in fact, uh, back in August, there was a survey by Pew Research Internet uh, that found Americans, at least, are roughly twice as likely to express worry, about 72%, than enthusiasm, 
33% about a future in which robots and computers are capable of doing many jobs that are currently done by humans. Um, I found uh, this uh, website, willrobotstakemyjob.com, to be somewhat amusing, but actually somewhat helpful uh, if you'd like to know if your career is about to be uh, obsolete and you need to go back to college. Um, but then there was a Forbes article from a couple months ago uh, noted uh, a paper that was a combination from MIT and Carnegie Mellon University researchers that predicted certain jobs were much more likely to re be replaced by machine learning and AI, and not just factory jobs. These were, um, you know, concierge jobs. We've already seen some of this happening. Mechanical drafters, interestingly enough, morticians, undertakers, and funeral directors. I, I, that one is a little perplexing to me, but okay. Credit <laughs> authorizers brokerage clerks, a lot of math related stuff. Um, and of course, there are certain jobs that are less likely, such as something very personal, a massage therapist, for example, um, you know, or something that's highly specialized to, uh, you know, you know, kind of human to human uh, contact. But the idea that AI might replace jobs, but instead of putting a bunch of people out of work, it allows a bunch of people to get better jobs, uh, perhaps more fulfilling jobs, jobs that require uh, a little bit of more of that human touch rather than that automation is definitely a rosy way to look at the future. So Ashley, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on robots taking your job? By the way, I, I looked up podcaster at willrobotstakemyjob.com and we're cool for now. Yeah, I feel like, um, I think like entertainers are sort of like, 37, 35% ish. So I'm, <laughs> I feel good. Um, but I, you know, who knows? The deep fakes are starting to get really scary. So maybe somebody will just like scan me into a computer and then actually, you know what? If I could scan myself into a computer and then teach an AI to do my job for me so that I could have leisure time but still collect a paycheck, I am super down <laughs> that. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, man, it's tough. It's really, this is, I think there are two major uh, hurdles that humanity will have to deal with in this century. And they are privacy. Digital privacy is like one of the biggest things for me that people are still evolving and trying to figure out how we want our privacy to be managed, uh, what it means, how we can be more transparent. Cause we sort of gave everybody a mile and then now that there's just the gate is open and how do you get that all back in? So, um, so there's that. And then I think the other thing is obviously AI and how that affects people in different jobs. And so, um, I saw, uh, I saw Roger type in real estate agent and you mentioned realtor, like those are jobs that may not be around, you know, like with apps and AI and machine learning, um, it would be very easy for me to type in, uh, hey, I I want to find a house that is like this, and here are some keywords, and then it just says here's every single house in the state or the country or wherever that you might be interested in in your price range, and so um, so I I think automation replacing humans is a is a really scary thing for a lot of people, and rightfully so. Although you can look at uh, the medical industry is a great example. Um, there have been quite a few stories about uh, particular. Uh, you know, reading a, a certain kind of x-ray uh, and trying to mm. diagnose a certain kind of thing that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The radiology um, sector uh, and, and others where it's starting to show more and more that the robot is actually more accurate, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take the job away from the doctor. It's the, the doctor health. then is freed up to make more of that, again, that human diagnosis that is personalized and expertise is absolutely needed and and that job doesn't go away. It just kind of takes the, 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 the paperwork out mm -hmm. of what this person is actually really good at doing. Um, and it, in a way, it makes their job better. Now, for somebody like a real estate agent, well, what if the job goes away, but the real estate agent really likes their job. So we might say, oh, but you have, you know, opportunity for a whole new career. What about those folks that don't see what that new career is? You know, what, right. what, what, that's what is, what that, are the I options for, for those about. folks? Yeah. I think that's what most people are worried about. And I mean, I think for me, like, you know, obviously like I, I have not studied politics or, or, you know, things 
like that. So it's very difficult for me to say like what my answer would be if I was in that position. Um, but I do think that at some point we will probably need some sort of um, program that helps people transition if their job is made obsolete. And honestly, like, I think we need more of that now. So like we see a lot of people talk about um, clean energy and moving to clean energy. And I think that's great. Um, but I'd really like to see more, even more initiatives or, you know, I, I would love to see, I know this is asking a lot, but I would love to see people care more about other people who are not like them and be maybe willing to pay, you know, 1% more in taxes every year to help these kinds of things happen, right? Where we help somebody who maybe had a job in a coal mine or was a realtor and their job got automated out to be able to apply for a program that retrains them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think this also all goes back to kind of a bigger argument about like college should be free, right? Or even just vocational school, like those types of things everybody should have access to because we are going to get to a point where people are going to need to retrain, you know, and start new careers. And if we don't give people those opportunities, well, what do we do with those people? And what do those people do with themselves? Like I post uh, fake news on Facebook. That's what they're doing. So it's like, I that to me is like, it's, it's, you know, it's a thing where it's like, you have to keep people learning and you have to take care of them. You have to care about them. Like we have to care about other people. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's very much a thing where we have to figure out a way to convince people who are not going to be affected by this. So for example, our politicians probably have a very low chance of being replaced by robots, right? And so they don't care as much as maybe somebody who is working in a coal mine that their job will be replaced. So how I mean, do you make those people care? Th there's so many moving pieces. I mean, yeah. you know, the retraining is is crucial because, you know, skills aren't fungible, right? Just because right. you're a coal miner doesn't mean suddenly you work with anything that involves a pickaxe pick exactly. and a shovel. Uh, the other thing is you need the jobs somewhat convenient, like close to that population, right? It's mm -hmm. great to have clean energy, but if those jobs are on I'm the other there. side of the country, yeah. doesn't really help those people who are out of work unless you can, you know, subsidize some sort of migration of those, of that Companies. population over to where the jobs are. I mean, like, you know, you know, North Dakota saw a boom in the number of people working the, 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 the fracking oil fields because they just, you know, they, they came from different parts of the country. They drove up there and set themselves up. But, you know, it, it, it's it's a policy thing, but it's a cultural shift as well, right? Yeah, with, well, the, yeah, with society. If I may wind us back from the precipice a bit oh. first, Before, <laughs> please. Uh, we start. We we you know we say like we need to incentivize the churches to help people more, and the community <laughs> centers, and 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 everything. Let's figure out how much this is going to actually happen because I don't think it's going to happen as much as some people think. It is definitely going to happen. And coal miners is always a great one yeah. because you're like, oh, well, you can obviously automate that. I wonder actually if it will impact it as much as people think because there are still skills in coal mining that require human intuition and human ingenuity. There's so many myths around this that you have to chase after, which is, first of all, AI isn't as good as you think it is. Right. Uh, no. It is, it is no. not going to replace. Oh, I think this is going to take... I mean, a lot yeah. of time for this to yeah, start right, really right. affecting there, there us. There is a down the road way. universe where we're like really dealing with like, oh wow, even customer service agents are. Right. It's are a problem. Maybe, that's that's a long way away. Not that we shouldn't think about it, but it's a long way away. In the short term, what's probably more likely to happen is what happened to computers, and by that I mean the people who did the computing when digital computers came along, which is those people rather than just massively being thrown out onto the streets and we had computer strikes and com you know computer demonstrations about being fired, those people will transition to other jobs and jobs arose, middle management became huge because suddenly you could afford to pay people to be middle managers, mm -hmm. blessing or a curse maybe, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> you could have product managers and project managers. I think what we're going to see in a lot of industries, not all, is that AI allows people to now use their actual skills instead of the drudgery, to actually mm -hmm. be more 
creative and for companies to say, you know what, we actually can pay people to answer the phone and talk to folks who need to talk to a human being where we couldn't before because we are saving money by AI handling all of this other stuff that we used to have to pay people to do. I'm, I'm not trying to be overly Pollyanna. I'm just trying to provide a little counterbalance. Yeah, I mean, it, and like I mentioned, it, there, there's a bunch of moving parts to it. And, th you know, this stuff is not going to, you know, you go to sleep one one day, one day, night and wake up. It's like, oh, I'm out of a job and everything in the world you know, <laughs> right, has changed. Right. Uh, but uh, it will impact various bits of the population, you know, it, more I mean, there, or less significantly. Now. Yeah. yeah, think about it now and say like, okay, what can our what can our communities do to to be prepared to help somebody who really isn't just changing their job, but their job is gone. I, I think it'll be a, a, a smaller percentage than people think, but it will happen. And so, yeah, we need we need to figure out the best way to handle that. Well, and what does what does higher education look like down the road? Uh, it, you know. Let's just whoever is what impacted. Does lower whether education look like down the road? I mean, well, I think that's, well, that's even a big part of it too. Absolutely. Well, you, exactly. If you down the road, if you know that a job is going to be, you know, has has been automated, you're probably not going to take that job. But let's say, uh, you know, I know a handful of people who have left. Uh, their job as attorneys because they're like being a lawyer actually really sucks. Uh, the money's great, but I hated right. it and went back to school and you know now do something else. Well, okay, but they chose to do that. You know, it was a, you know sure. it, it, there was a um, an economic privilege to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, sure, some people lose their jobs and and go back to school or go to you know specialized training for something else. But that costs time and money. Um, you know, I once I once thought right. like it'd be fun to be an acupuncturist, but it's like really expensive and takes like four years. I was like, well, when would I ever do that? And you thought, what's the point? And the, <laughs> 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 kind of, actually, yes. Uh, but 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 those are things that are. I mean, they're huge hurdles into uh, deciding to change a job if you are forced to change a job. And you don't have the time or money to change that job. Yeah. Then it turns into, yeah, how do we fund things like this? Even if it's a small group of people, maybe mm -hmm. it's not millions of people across the world, you know, not, not anytime soon, but it, you know, it will happen. And what do, what do those who aren't in danger of losing their jobs to something like this do to help the others? Yeah. I think, um, I think you and Tom make good points in that, like, Obviously, like the, the the majority of people in any given industry, even with progress, automation, robotics, things like that, like they will evolve into new jobs, right? That are that are created within that industry that sort of branch out from the thing they used to do, and and maybe they do uh, have the ability to actually do the thing that they wanted to do originally, but maybe uh, bogged down in you know paperwork or anything that requires automation. Like I yeah, yeah. I totally get that, um, but I would imagine there's probably like a decent percentage of people on both ends of that majority where one end of them simply do not have the resources to do anything and and are not able to transition um which we see now i mean just even when companies evolve yeah. like i mean this is just and and i'm sure like your example with you know with with when we went from analog to digital like very similar thing like some of those people just never worked in computing again, like a probably smaller, much smaller percentage than the people who just transitioned to digital. But I'm sure there are the, there are those who are like, well, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that, or I'm too old to learn that, or I don't want to, or whatever, and decided not to continue in that industry. And so, or maybe they just don't like it. Like Sarah was saying, you know, maybe it's just, I'm not into this. This is very stressful and I want out. And so, um, so yeah, I think I think it will happen much slower than we think. I mean, I can't even get Siri to give me like any information. So I like I'm not particularly worried about it on a regular basis. Yeah. When I see Google uh, show off that assistant feature that can call and make dinner reservations for you, I'm like I start worrying about the part time a college student who's also an assistant to somebody who needs that money to make their rent like that. Those are the small people who kind of slip through the cracks here where maybe they don't have a full time job and it's not their industry, but it is how they live. And so I feel like those small jobs that automation will eat up, those will be the first to go. And I think that, that those we, we should still be thinking about it sooner ish rather than later, because even if it's not disrupting 
the entire country as a culture. We still have to worry about those people who need that 20 hours a week to make their rent, you know, and maybe can't. All right. Uh, good, good points all. And let's move on to our final discussion. This is the one that was voted on by the patrons at the advisor level at patreon.com slash DTNS. It was nominated by Steve and Steve was nice enough to write us a little introduction for us. Uh, he says, hi, Tom, Sarah, Roger, Nicole, and Ashley. I've been working in information security and data center operations side of IT for about 20 years. So security and privacy has always been important to me. Over the years, we've seen breach after breach to the point where we barely discuss them anymore. We have seen regulations get passed by local, state, federal, and international governments, which have a direct impact on how we operate our organizations from an IT security and control standpoint. For example, in the United States, I think each of the 50 states now has its own data breach notification law on the books. Add in any breach notification requirements from Sarblane's Oxley, Graham Leach Billy Act, Payment Card Industry Act, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, aka HIPAA, and of course the GDPR, and the compliance landscape is becoming very crowded very quickly. In my opinion, these regulations have both a positive and negative effect on organizations and the tech we use. I'm in favor of an increased focus on security and privacy. However, for small businesses, I think we're approaching a tipping point and it's becoming more and more difficult to keep track of and comply with all the different rules, regulations, and laws. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the changing compliance landscape is affecting businesses, technologies, and the way we're using tech. P.S. Love the show, and you're all doing a great job. Your boss <laughs> advisor, Steve I. So thank you, Steve. Um, I actually found a great article just from this week on the Harvard Business Review from Andrew Burt. He's the chief privacy officer at a company called Immuta. He's also their legal engineer. And his column was talking about why privacy regulations don't always do what they're meant to. And he points out something that Steve touched on too, which is small businesses having a bigger burden to comply with these things than large businesses. Uh, for example, uh, we have in, in the column from uh, Bert, Brent Ozar's Microsoft SQL Server consulting company stopped selling stuff in Europe because he couldn't afford the cost of compliance and he didn't want to risk getting it wrong by cheaping out on it. Uh, regulations generally are proportionally more of a burden on small businesses. Broad rules that treat all companies the same encourage this. So it's not like we're seeing businesses go out of business. It's not like you know the GDPR has, has, has caused a wipeout, but it is affecting smaller businesses in greater proportion. In fact, there's been a few studies showing that ads uh, for for Google have increased in the Europe as a result of GDPR because there are some of the competitors leaving the market because they don't want to have to comply. Whereas a company with as much cash as Google has no problem attempting to comply and can even deal with the inevitable complaints and lawsuits that arise out of it. Uh, California's Consumer Privacy Act opts out specific business segments, such as many smaller organizations. And Bert thinks this is maybe a better model which is regulation should encourage small companies to pool their data, uh, to follow proper procedures as organizations, to compete with larger organizations. And you should, if you're gonna have a regulation for privacy, identify that it's a different burden and a different level of compliance necessary for a small business, a medium business, an enterprise level business. Uh, and he also mentions privacy enhancing technologies, often called PETs. Things like differential privacy, you hear Apple talk about that all the time. There's also homomorphic encryption, federated learning, modular data systems like solid. I, I think, and I talked about this on my editor's desk uh, today, uh, I think all of these are ways to give the customer more control over the data. And the faster we get customers to be able to control their own data, the easier it is for any business of any size to comply because they don't need to handle the data anymore. The customer has control over it. Anyway, I'll finish this introduction up with uh, Bert's quote. He says, we cannot assume that we are ever fully informed about the privacy we're giving up at any single point in time. Consumers must be able to exercise rights over their data after it's been collected. That's something the solid platform allows you to do. And those rights should include restricting how it's being used. So, uh, wow, lot, lot to, to chew on here, uh, but, you know, what What do y'all think about this idea that that if we're going to have these regulations, which I don't think anyone disagrees that we need some kind of regulation on, on privacy. Ashley, you identified it earlier as as one of the two big challenges 
uh, going forward in this century. How, how do we make sure that we're not accidentally just making the bigger companies richer and bigger at the expense of the smaller companies? Nicole, what do you think? I like, I, it's such a big, hard problem. Like I just, I think the, yeah, the, the question about whether, which company, I think it's true that smaller companies would probably have an issue with it, but at the very heart of it, it's not just giving the customer control over their privacy, which is definitely a huge part of this, but like making them even aware that they have control. Mm. Like, like that is such, I think, a barrier. Like if yeah. you tell my mom that there are all these settings that she could do in Facebook to like block certain people, she'd be like, I don't know any of those settings. I don't want I don't want to know any of those settings. Care. Because yep. it's just it's just too much. And I think there has to be a way to not just make them aware of these issues, but to sort of educate them in a way that's easy, that's easy to grasp, and to make the tools easier to use. Yeah. Because you know go. Yeah. Well, but, but, and the, you know, the, the mom on Facebook is a great example. It's like, well, you know, if mom says, I don't care, it just doesn't matter to me. And you say, well, but it has to matter. It, you know, it's very important that it matters. It's like, what are the options besides scaring people into it? Because if you're scared, you're already scared. You, you know, if you, if privacy is important, then you're already going to be like, this is actually really bad unless you know what you're yeah. doing. You have to, you have to go the extra mile to make sure that you're protected. But for those who say, mm, it doesn't really matter. And how do you do that? It's sort of like a commercial, right? Like commercials <laughs> have certain tactics. Like you either, you know, you kind of scare somebody into buying a product. Like how do you, how, how do you convince uh, a person or a business um, that uh, it's really important to either comply with uh, with 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 privacy uh, uh, ethics or a person to demand that a business comply with privacy ethics when there is um, you know, uh, well, right. a, a, a lack of care. Yeah, right. Right now, we leave it up to the companies to do this. Mm -hmm. And the, and even laws like GDPR leave it up to the companies. And the remedy is you can sue them. Well, most of us are not going to sue them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it's the fear that somebody big enough will sue them that keeps them in line. I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about it. That's why I do like these decentralized systems that say you are now in control of your data. And what's great about a decentralized system is if you have a third party managing it, or multiple third parties managing it, they can make it easy. I mean, Nicole, you hit it. You've got to have a simple interface. You got to make it easy for someone to say, oh, okay, I I know that I have to use my my solid ID. I don't have to know anything about how it works. All I know is I have to have one. So I went and I signed up for one. And then whenever I sign up for Facebook or WhatsApp or Snapchat, it asks me simple questions. Can we know this about you in your in your solid ID? And I mm. say, no, and then that's it. And I don't have to learn Facebook's interface and Google's interface and Apple's interface, you know, and become an expert in all these things. I've got one interface that's easy to use. The question is, and I'm not saying that I advocate this, but should that be the law? Then just say, hey, companies, if you want to have personal data, you've got to use a trusted third party platform to manage it. You can't keep it yourself anymore. I don't know that you can, though, because uh, you can't make that the law. But I think I think you, what you're just like the way you describe it, it's like, oh, it's one password, but for my privacy. Right. And like, that's great. I love that idea. I think I would use that all day, every day. Like, that's fantastic. But I think it's that the laws have to be that we are in charge of our data. Not that th that you have to use these companies. I think that much like every other web platform that we've seen, like whatever the best one is generally or whatever, you know, works for most people is going to be the one that people use. So I think to, to say like you have to use this service, you have to use that service to, you know, get your privacy uh, stuff sorted out as a business, like. I don't see that happening. And I think that's unfair and anti-competitive. And so I, you know, I think it's going to end up being that the regulation has to be based on giving data back to the user. And then on the private side of it, it has to be companies have to step up and be like, here's a solution that is not only easy for 
the user, the end user, but also easy for a company to sign mm -hmm. up with us. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that that really is going to be, I mean, convenience is king online. And so yeah. if you make it easy yeah. and, and you make it simple and people go, oh, like this is a new service that allows you to control what data goes out on, on all of the internet for every service you sign up, it gives you a pop-up when you sign in, ask you some questions, like you said, Tom, and then you just save it and that's it. And you can go back to it much like in one password. I can click on whatever website that I have an account with and it'll say, here's your settings. Would you like to re go through the process again? Sure. And then you click on it and you can do it again. Or maybe it forces you to go re go through that process every six oh, months. Yeah. 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 You know, I have to change my password at CBS interactive every 90 days. Oh, it's annoying, cool. but it is, <laughs> but it is helpful and it is more secure. You would, you could argue it's more secure. So, it says okay. that it's not good anymore. Anyway, that's, a I know, but it's I, like, I hate it. But the thing is, is like, you could do that and like people could update their privacy settings like facebook already does this it notifies you it says hey you haven't checked your privacy settings in a while would you like to do it most you people like review them. yeah i think that's a good click, idea. Away, click away from most it most people the click is, it away yeah most that's, people click that's it away. the key mm. that's the problem so yeah. most people are like all right let's get it out of here close the little X maybe it's that the law right. says that you must prompt user you must force users to go through their privacy God, it's settings like jury once a duty year. or something. Yeah, it's jury <laughs> duty. Oh, God. It's your, it's privacy your setting duty time to of your year. own private data. I still think you could have a law. Service. Again, I'm not sure I, that I want this, but I think you could have a law that says if you are going to collect private data from people, you have to use an open standard. A open standard service. Yeah. I think that that is fair, but I yeah. just I don't think you could say like you have to yeah. use in a company. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I wonder also, like, if you could have forced the companies to give to give you like a monthly summary of who's who who they who they sold your data to. I would love or that. something <laughs> or something like, like that. You know, like force the company to say, "Here's who we sold your data to." <laughs> something you like that. I don't know. When you're, people, when you're, would, people would be so pissed and it might oh, yeah. actually galvanize them to be like, "No, I don't want you to sell all my data. Like, how can yeah. I fix this?" Have you ever right. loaded a video game and have it give like tips while it's loading, right? Where it's like, yeah. you know, you can you can go into your your, uh, <laughs> your loot box and do this f funny thing. What if what if when you were actually it slowed down using, the internet when you were using your decentralized ID thing, it would just pop up a card that said, "Hey, did you know Facebook has your phone number?" Yeah, just remind right. me. You know, like do do that every once in a while rather than force you to review, but just kind of pop up an information slide. You can still dismiss it. But it might jar you to go like, oh right, I forgot. But that. Who, but who's providing that slide? The, your decentralized <laughs> <The service>. identity <laughs> thing that runs service. locally for just you. Right, but but who's writing the slides? Well, it's just in the software, and it, and it's, okay. it's who's it's, programming the software. So if it was like one password, you would ha you would have a piece right, of software yeah, yeah. that was a, run by a company that would say like, okay, well you have all these accounts. At all these different websites and then so if you go to that website you get that pop-up that's like hey by the way like facebook has your phone number and here are the companies that it sold it to last month or you whatever like that without having to know anything about someone you just yeah. know what the fields are and you look and what see I, it right. what so. i would love to what i would love to have like love 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 to have if i see an ad on facebook i want to know how they got that metric like what did what did i go what what, what did i do Don't they have what something did i go like similar that tell me how they know that I was interested in this thing. Like I would love to have like a little like detail. Yeah, at the very least have all that ad stuff where you can see like where, where how it's targeting you. Like you yeah. can see that. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that and I mean, that's why there are so many conspiracy theories about your devices listening to you listening when, it, when, you know, Facebook messenger wasn't even open, but then all of a sudden I got an ad about something. I told my husband that we for sure never looked for and well, I, who knows? But but yeah, it's like but people yeah, really like no one really Facebook knows what's going on knows. with 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 tar with with how targeting works half the time. Yeah, yeah, it's a black box for sure. It is. It really is, and it's just it's. However, whatever the solution is, like what we're in right now is just not good. Like, and it's, it's not good. It's so bad, either, right? Because this is where this whole conversation started. With small businesses can't afford to keep up with a lot of these best practices. Yeah, so an open standard would help them too, because it would take the burden off of them to say, "Hey, let's have a decentralized invest platform. in a platform." Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad we solved that, Internet. <laughs> <laughs> Mischief managed. Job done. <laughs> 
Thank you. A uh, wow. wonderful round table today, um, particularly because we had such great round table contributors. Uh, Ashley Esqueda, we'll start with you. Thanks so much for being on the show and let folks know where they can keep up with all your work. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I host a show called Stream Economy on CNET's YouTube channel, and it's really fun. And the very first episode a long time ago, I got hit in the face with a pie. Hmm. Uh, but we talk oh my about God. We talk about geek pop culture every week and it's uh but it's like kind of a deep dive so um we sort of shifted the format earlier in uh, a couple months ago and so now we talk about like, one topic so i think our last episode before i went on vacation was about google stream so we talked about you know project stream what it was um if it's good or bad and what it could mean for the future of like game streaming so we talk about movies tv shows and games that are streaming online so uh, it's really fun, and we it's made with two people. It's me and uh, my producer, Logan, and we work really, really hard on it. And so if you happen to catch it on a Saturday, uh, that'd be great. And we're coming back next week with uh, our BlizzCon episode. We're going to BlizzCon, so I think it'll be a blast. Excellent. Also, thanks to Nicole Lee for joining us. Nicole is a regular uh, guest here on DTNS. So nice to see you again, Nicole. Um, also, former colleague of mine. What are What's going on at Engadget these days and what can people catch up with? So we have a lot of stuff happening. Uh, a couple of conferences coming up, I think still. A lot of events, in general, a lot of reviews coming in. So I'll be doing that for sure. Um, sorry, I'm going to be on the way out. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for having me. You can just go to twitter.com slash, slash Nicole for all of that and more. This, folks, will be the last roundtable for a while. Uh, unfortunately, we're below the milestone that got us the roundtable, so we're adjusting some things. But we're also adding new things, like the Editor's Desk audio column I mentioned. Posted one today for patrons at the $5 level with more of my thoughts on the Kinza thermometer and Clorox ad story and personal privacy in general. You can get that and more at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, well, I've got an email address for you. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Join us if you can. Always nice to have you live and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Lamar Wilson as our guest. Talk to you then. of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> oh, that was so good. It was so fun. Good show. Was fun. Good, good show. Time. That was that was a good 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 one to uh to go on hiatus on. Nicole, well, we're totally hanging out. Say it like that. We're gonna keep doing What's shows. That? What, what what did you say, Ashley? We're totally hanging out at yeah. CES. <laughs> yeah, CES. This is in two months, right? Two, two uh, months. Yeah, and they confirmed all our hotel stuff via email. Oh, yeah, like two days ago, and I was like, no. Will we want to hang out with you guys too? We'll please, be there. Uh, please, please, please. I think we're. I think CNET is actually. I think our stage now is going to be in Tech West. Like our. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I think we're moving. Oh, right? like maybe I'm not sure if we're doing it for sure or not. Tech but West is like the, at the at the former Hilton or whatever it is, right? It's that's it the called? one where it's over at the. Uh, is it the uh, what? Is, well, former Hilton is Westgate, right? The Sands, yeah, Westgate. Right? Sorry, Westgate. I don't know where Tech West is. Yeah. I'm always at the main. I'm always at South Hall, so it's like yeah. Te but Tech I, West is uh, Westgate. That's right. I know that some of our maybe just I, like I don't know I don't know what's official and what isn't, but I think maybe we're we might be. Man, and we've had a stage at Tech West, so it's not a new thing. I just am not sure what is going on with the other the one. The first year I worked at CNET, we were in the um, we were in the the the, the parking lot, <laughs> basically, like we were in a yeah. tent. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. I was at Ziff Davis. And then, that was where it's at. And then the sec the next year we got the South Hall, and we you guys have been there ever since. Yeah, it's a, it's an era if you move out of that. Yeah, it's we'll see. I like I I know that there's been a lot of like chatter about like what like what we can offer with tours and stuff mm -hmm. like where because it's so big now it's like it, yeah, ridiculous. there's so much show hopefully they'll keep the lights on through the event this time. oh my god i hope central hall just oh, keeps yeah. power. that would be so great
Yeah, that a little moment this year. Was a little. The, I was sure the, the CEA folks are like, oh, please, can you just forget about that? Can we just let it go? <laughs> yeah, We're I know. So tired I, know. Of about it. I won't let it go. Not ever. I have to say, though, they were very good at uh, responding. And, and we were able to get our show uh, going, even though Central Hall was out of power. Um, so they, 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 they scrambled pretty well for us anyway. But yeah, no, that was spooky when that, like the show floor being empty and dark in the middle of the day. I, I will say it reminded me of way back when, when there were rolling blackouts and we were mm -hmm. at Tech TV and there would be just a random out. Oh, yeah. In the the building. brownouts or whatever. We were all in the dark and we just start talking about, like, yeah. Be doing. That used to be a, a thing. Like, you, you'd you have a, a set thing that you would do when the, when the rolling blackout came. Because all the engineers started playing with like this silly putty stuff, and all the writers would drink tequila in my office. Oh, that's cool. Oh, wow. Nice. I still had to go to the studio <laughs> because we had a backup diesel generator yeah. on the roof. Oh, yeah, diesel. On TV. Wow. <laughs> oh my Those God. Things. Fortnite Dev Epic Games raises $1.25 billion in funding. Wow. <laughs> all potatoes. Uh, what do you like about? Domo, domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. Domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. Domo. No, title. Domo, domo. Oh, oh, got it. The title for the show? I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. catch that. Oh, I'm sorry. But like, is a title <laughs> for the show. No, Roger was just like, do you like that song? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good song. It's one of the few good... songs I will listen through. Because uh, of speaking, the automation discussion. Speaking of like auto, automated economy, I just went to the Amazon Go store here in San Francisco, like a couple yesterday, and yeah. that's the store where like there's like no cashier. You just go right. in. Yeah. You swipe your phone and then you just put. It was weird because <laughs> it was it was it felt it felt very dystopian. I don't know how else to describe it. It was odd. Like not just go in and go out and nobody. Human you contact is not allowed. <laughs> well, along with your food items, take your purchases, <laughs> leave store immediately. Yeah, so that was interesting. But the thing is, there were a lot more Amazon employees than I expected. There were like a lot of like, uh, just stock refilling and just people milling about. Hovering. They're hovering. Yeah, hovering. Hey, if you have so. time to lean. Well, you know, that, and that goes back to our conversation about automation is when you don't need people to be running the cash register, it's not like you fire them. You No, they're still around. Them. You just have <laughs> them mill around. Yeah. yeah. You, you won't have empty shelves anymore because they're all be able to. And then when the robots are stocking the shelves, then they'll find something oh, else. Well, yeah. You, you, you hover around the, uh, hover around the yeah. answer questions, you know? <laughs> um, film struck down. Oh, that's oh, not bad. Not yeah. bad. Um, oh, yeah. jobs. Smile, you're in step camera. Mm, that was quick hit. All right, yeah, you guys. I have ones, but I yeah. have to uh, get back to uh, work. Same. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Bye, friends. Thank you, right. Nicole Thanks, and Ashley. Ashley. Have a wonderful you were, weekend. You two were awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Let's say hi to the doggies. I, I will hug all three of them for you. Oh. Bye. 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 Okay. We'll be at lunch soon. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll email you. Okay, bye. Bye. And bye, video people. Thanks for watching and hanging out with us. And have a lovely time. Audio people stick around. There's